Nice. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, earlier, uh, Kimberly and I are friends. <clears throat> so if we digress in our conversation at some <laughs> point and say, oh, snap. I really like your boots. Where did you get those boots? Just redirect, oh, somebody yeah. redirect us. <laughs> um, but no, I love the introduction. Thank you so much for having us. This is a beautiful facility, right? beautiful crowd. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> um, it's such an honor. But uh, we were just talking about how we don't like to introduce our books because it's, it's yeah. so stressful. It always to, sounds so much better when somebody else describes yes, your book, right? Exactly. <laughs> You're like, well, I wrote a book and it's, it's a, a mom and a daughter and a lot of things <laughs> happen and it's just not as exciting, you know. Anyway, so um, thank you so much for having us. So I'm going to start. We're going to um, have a little conversation um, between Kimberly and I. And we have, again, we have some questions written out. Um, but we tend to get a little sidetracked <laughs> sometimes. Um, because they're, uh, these are things we talk about with ourselves um, mm -hmm. as well as readers. Yeah, we have an ongoing text string that yeah. we go back and forth with yeah. all the time. Yeah. Probably a little too much. With good news <laughs> and with bad, bad news, news at times. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to kick it off um, by paying you a compliment that I, I think you that. are the absolute <laughs> queen of domestic oh, suspense. Thank you. I <laughs> She is. I will take it. Where's my tear? <laughs> love. Put, your, put your crown on. Um, but I really, I, you know, I believe that. I love your books. I think um, they're they're incredible. I learn from them. I'm entertained by them always. But um, but they are domestic suspense. They they cover um, home relationships and um, husbands, spouses sisters, brothers, friends, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it about those relationships that intrigues you and, and that make you feel like make for a good suspense? Right. Um, well, I write the kind of books that I like to read. And the reason that I like them um, is exactly like you said, the relationship um, when you start with the basis, a relationship is the basis of the story. So, and I tend to concentrate a lot, gravitate towards marriages. Um, but, you know, it's something that is recognizable to everyone. Mm -hmm. You can, as a reader, you can see yourself in the story. You know, everybody is a child of someone. A lot of people are parents. A lot of people are married or have been through a divorce. I mean, these are all situations that... Um, everybody can recognize and everybody can see. So I think that's part of the charm of these kinds of stories. And then when you throw in a suspense angle, so money goes missing or a child goes missing or um, a husband may or may not have died on this plane crash, <laughs> um, that throws in an element where, you know, if you recognize yourself in the, in the main character of the story and then you throw in the suspense angle, then all of a sudden it's, like almost like living vicariously, but from the comfort of your own couch, right? And um, without all the danger and suspense, but still with all the excitement. Yeah. So it's, it puts you in this place where as you're reading this story, you're thinking, hmm, if this happened to me, and it could, you yeah. know, none of my premises are so far-fetched. Um, so it's, it's stuff that could happen in real life. And then as a reader, you think wow, what would I have done in this situation? Right. And that kind of makes it a very personal. And um, readers, I mean, I, I don't know if y'all feel that way. I feel this way. I love to put myself in the main character's for place sure, and yes. imagine like, and how, like, how would I react? Don't open the door. <laughs> right. Run. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And like, really, how would I deal with yeah. that? And your situations yeah. are very, could be very true yeah. to life. Yeah. Maybe yeah. some rip from the headlines, Some perhaps. have been, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I, um, and like I said, I like to read those kind of books as well. So, yeah. 
um, it just feels naturally natural for me to try to tell that time type yeah. of story. So, which brings me to the Southern Gothic thing. <laughs> <laughs> which is the opposite of what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. So Emily writes these um, very Southern Gothic um, and why don't you tell? You can define it better than I can. I don't, I don't know. Um, and, and what are the specific boxes you have to check in order to right. qualify as something? Yeah. Well, I don't know that, you know, I'm not the keeper of all the boxes. <laughs> but, and, and there's a lot encompassed within Southern Gothic. But for me, it starts with just gothic literature and that's kind of what um, I've always gravitated to what I came up on was you know um, the good old uh, Bronte sisters mm -hmm. were my sisters <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know I was I loved you know uh, running across the moor with the heather and the the Kathy is scratching on the glass and let me in mm -hmm. Heathcliff you know <laughs> I love that stuff so um, anything gothic um, was definitely my jam. <clears throat> and then I started writing books, and people started calling them Southern Gothic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I did kind of have to go back and say, oh, well, you know, I do, I do kind of have a background in this. I love Flannery O'Connor, and um, I try William Faulkner. I try really hard. <laughs> um, but he's difficult for me to read. Mm -hmm. Eudora Welty, Carson McCullers, some of my biggest heroes. And so I've, I've really kind of spent the last um, several years trying to figure out what that means, Southern Gothic. So mm -hmm. for sure, it's Gothic. It's the old houses, the decaying houses, the death. There's a bit of madness thrown in. There's um, possibly a ghost, possibly not. We don't know. We're never sure. You know, there's, there, um, there is um, often a brooding hero, and um, there's definitely always someone running away from the castle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in her nightgown sometimes. But then Southern Gothic layers in that whole idea of what the South once was and what it is now and what's been mm. lost, and um, the sort of crumbling aristocracy. And then, of course, the, the, the problems and the shame of the South, you mm. know, dealing with slavery and all of these issues of, of, of misplaced, um, not loyalty, but just, you know, misplaced mm. values. And um, so there's, there's that whole, whole sort of cultural comment going on as well. And that's not... All of my books don't check all of those boxes, mm -hmm. but I, I tend to gravitate to one element or the other mm -hmm. in that. So that was a very long <laughs> answer <laughs> to your questions. Mm -hmm. um, but it just, it does attract me, mm -hmm. um, definitely. So um, speaking of like horrific situations <laughs> in our books, which we both we both write pretty harrowing and uncomfortable topics, right? right? Um, because our goal is to scare people mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Thrill them. Thrill them, yes. Um, confuse them, mm -hmm. confound them. Yeah, all right? of the above. So are there, are there any, any kind of subjects or situations that you would not touch? Touch. Um, I always said I don't know if I could write about a missing child um, because I'm a mother. I have two kids, and then they got big and grown, and I thought, hmm, I'll do a story about a missing child. So. <laughs> you were like, over that problem. <laughs> right? So it, it took me a number of years to, you know, get put some space between me and yeah. that that part of my um, own life experience. Um, I've also written about domestic abuse, um, and that is a subject that um, has touched my personal life. A dear friend of mine um, was abused by her husband. We were family friends for years and years and years, and our husbands were friends. Our kids, were, we actually know each other through our boys, and um, went on family vacations together, and the point of me telling you all that is that none of us had any idea. She was so good at keeping it 
super quiet until he abused her in a way that she just was kind of basically forced to come out of the closet and ask for help. And um, one of the first things she said to me was, you have to tell this story. And um, I'm not sure it was something that I would have picked up myself, but she encouraged me. And again, it took me a couple of, it was probably at least two years before I could say, <clears throat> okay, I think I'm ready to tell this story in a way that will um, do it justice and not, you know, put you in a weird spot or me in a place that, I don't know. I just wanted to be very respectful when I told it. So um, I've, I've tackled those subjects. I actually proposed uh, um, an aftermath of a shooting subject, and my publisher was like, whoa, no, yep. we're not touching that. Was that. The yeah, untouchable subject for them. For them. And I, I actually wanted to approach it in a way that, you know, it wasn't like the violence on the page, but just the aftermath part of it. But they were like, we don't, not, not going to happen. So, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, I mean, we do write about these um, horrible things happening. And the, the, at least for me, you know, I want my heroines to be their own heroine kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, they do, they do come out the other end of the story and triumphant or, you know, better or smarter mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, so I think, you know, I don't know if there's one subject that I won't touch. I think the, the trick is to come at it in a way that um, is maybe... I don't know, more respectful. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know. I mean, I, I do feel for me there are, you know, I cover some pretty traumatic things as well. And um, I feel like when something is in my family, something like in my immediate family that we've had to deal with, I, I don't think Can't I could write it. about that. Uh, what because it feels it? like a privacy yeah. thing. And, and just like, I, I'm often in the middle of dealing with some of this stuff, so I can't Some writer, some author, and I can't remember who it was, but she, I think it was a she, it feels like it was a she, said something like, right, like you're an orphan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really it, yeah, you, Yeah. I don't know if I could do that. It's hard to do, yeah, it though. Hard to do that. It's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. But, but, um, Speaking of themes and subjects, are there any themes that you keep coming to in your books or any ones that you have to like really stick to in order to stick in the Southern Gothic? Um, well, I think definitely in terms of relationship themes, um, and I didn't, I didn't even realize this until, again, like I... I'm so close into what I write, I d it's hard for me to step out of it and sort of deconstruct what it is I'm writing about, uh, you know, in a, in a bigger sense. Um, but I did have a friend say to me once, um, he was like, all of your books are about these main characters with troubling relationships with their mothers. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know why. <laughs> why could that be? And I have a lovely mother, but I mean, you know, we, we have our difficult relationships. Sometimes those mother-daughter relationships are, are tricky to navigate. So apparently, you know, I'm working it's, that it's out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the other thing um, he said, which was funny, and he was like, and and you're, you're always, there's always some horrific thing about nature. Like, yes. are you scared yes. of nature? Yes, you do. <laughs> no. There are snakes and gators and, I yeah. know, like there's alligator attacks and there's snakes falling out of trees. And it's like yeah. all of my fears, you know, I put them <laughs> on, on the page. On the, there's, you know, cliffs to fall off of. And yes, so, um, those aren't necessarily Southern Gothic, although gators might be. Yeah, kind of, yeah, it's kind and of Southern yeah. Gothic. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that they necessarily transcend to Southern Gothic. I will say that one thing I did um, explore in my first book, um, burying the honeysuckle girls, um, was this whole sort of historically accurate idea of. Um, occurrence of 
uh, committing women to mental um, institutions, um, you know, back in, in, in the past for basically just about any reason whatsoever um, a woman could be committed. Um, I, I set the story in a hospital called Pritchard Hospital. It's the stand-in for Bryce Hospital um, in Tuscaloosa. Um, and I did a whole lot of research about all the reasons um, that a woman could have been um, committed uh, for any reason whatsoever by her husband who was tired of her or nagging for, or whatever yeah, yeah. or cooking dinner wrong yeah. or you know or just an inconvenient woman um, if she had any sort of mental um, disorder any kind of depression anxiety um, addiction issues um, yeah so that was very eye-opening mm -hmm. to me and and it was a little traumatic reading these real stories about, about you know... Infuriating, when, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. all the patients, but women in particular who were, who were very vulnerable to that. And um, that is one of the reasons I changed the name of the hospital mm -hmm. is out of respect for the real people who suffered, you know, greatly there. I didn't want to diminish their real stories mm -hmm. um, with my made up story yeah. so yeah. yeah um so yeah speaking of and that's that kind of leads me to the next question because as I did that research about like different situations um of these patients in the hospital I had a very visceral reaction to that mm -hmm. it affected me deeply so right. I'm wondering like when you write certain scenes do you find yourself like really affected emotionally you know, it's funny. We just sat in um, a few minutes on the romance panel and um, listened to them. They were great. And then we went... They were a lot funnier than we are. <laughs> <laughs> they were fabulous. Yes. And then we um, were talking afterwards, and we were talking about how difficult it is to write a sex scene. Not that I've had that much. I mean, my stories don't really... Although, you know, I do write a, a lot about marriages. Um, but... It's it's hard because when you're in when you're actually writing a scene like a sex scene or a murder scene or a chase scene or whatever you really you're you're writing the words but you're really concerned with like the craft of it right yeah. and the technical and the choreography and you're thinking well you know the hand goes there or the you know whatever it is yeah. that you're writing um, so I'm not sure I get the viscerals while I'm writing except for maybe frustration and despair. <laughs> <laughs> Not visceral. because of what's going on with the character, but despair right, because, because the paragraph's too yes, long or exactly, something. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, um, but I think, you know, what you were saying about when you're doing the research or when you get the idea for a premise for a story or a mm. character that you're like, oh, and when that, when that like gets in you and it, it, it makes that you, lift. A, yeah, yes. that's when you know you've got something. Um, those are when I, those moments are when I get the visceral reactions yeah. or much later. So I always reread my book before it comes out and I go on tour because I've been known when I don't do that. I'll get questions like, so tell me about Joe. And I'm like, who's Joe? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember a Remind Joe. Remind me again <laughs> Which about one was Joe. he? So I do actually go back and re I read my book. Yeah. And um, sometimes then I'll get the viscerals in, you know, oh, I remember really loving this person. Or oh, I remember, you know, how... Um, and how crazy this scene was, mm -hmm. or um, sometimes I'll think, like, how did I ever come up with this? Mm -hmm. What is wrong with <laughs> me? Um, those are the kinds of viscerals. But actually writing, I mean, do you? I, I, it doesn't happen to me no. a lot, but I, I will say um, in my first book, um, Honeysuckle Girls, there it's a dual timeline, present day and 19... 37, I think, in Alabama, six or seven. <laughs> Again, I don't remember. <laughs> but um, but so there is a, uh, the main character, Jen, has this, she's very fearful of her abusive father and now abusive husband. And the end of that story is, 
I was upset. And mm. and it's that's really the only time I've ever felt really personally affected mm -hmm. where I had to like get up from the desk and like walk around. Wow. And you just say this is I you know this was hard to write mm -hmm. and and this is affecting me but that's okay you yeah, know that's well, that's it's real but yeah. it doesn't it doesn't happen as my, and that might have just been cuz it was my first book and yeah. and it was new to yeah. me to write I was more attached to my characters than the first books you know yeah. like letting that go yes. and actually handing it over yeah did more to me and now I'm like here take it <laughs> <laughs> this is so now I have an off like I want to veer off the script if we can for a minute but yeah. you mentioned something about that idea and that lift moment like mm -hmm. do you have a moment where it's like I have a book this is a book um yes how, how, what is that like yes well so um I actually only have this I have six this Summer is my sixth book coming out, and my book that just came out last year, Dear Wife, is this really special, um, that, that was like a gift from the writing gods. Um, I, was, I had just turned in a proposal for a different book, um, and I went to bed, and in the middle of the night, the idea for Dear Wife woke me up, and... Um, I mean, I knew everything about that story. I knew who was going to be in it. I knew how I was going to structure it, beginning and ev the whole thing. And um, while the house slept, I just stared at the ceiling and it played like a movie in my head. Ugh. I don't know how to make that happen again. Yes. <laughs> but yes, I woke up the next morning. I was like, this is it. This is it. like throw the other yeah. proposal out. You know. But when I'm coming up with normal, when normal ideas come to me, you typically know when it's when it's book worthy, but but I often get it. Um, I get it for other ideas too, and then I let it sit for a day. And if I don't feel that way the second day, sometimes you have to let it sit, yeah. and then you realize. What and about if you? it's still calling to you, yeah. I do feel like <clears throat> if I can come up with a great, intriguing idea that I'm excited about, and like that's got a an interesting hook you know, that initial hook idea that you read on the back of a book and you're like, oh, this yeah. is, yeah. yeah. And then if I can marry that to an ending that mm -hmm. I feel like is very satisfying, I'm like, oh, that's a book. Yeah. And then I get that like little yeah. rush of excitement, yeah. like, ooh. Yeah. The visceral. Yes. <laughs> the good stuff. Yes. I love it. All right, so we're going to go back to um, the scary stuff now. Yay. Um, so, like Emily said, we're friends, so I happen to know that she is a horror buff. <laughs> like, don't even talk to her about Stephen King or bring up pig's blood because uh, we'll be here all day. <laughs> but where does this fascination come from? And, and, and you actually incorporate some of these horror elements into your stories without pushing you over into the horror genre. Yeah, no. So what is, the, what is, what is that? I don't know where it comes from. I don't. I I don't know where it comes from. I think. Um, I mean, it's strange because I'm literally the most fearful person in the world. I hate to get on an airplane. I don't like a roller coaster. I don't like to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm close to death. I don't. That is not an enjoyable. I would never skydive. Mm -mm. Never. No, me neither. Um, and I mean, I'm just a Brady cat, but for some, <laughs> for some reason, I love horror movies and horror books, and I always have, and <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't feel real to me, right. you know what I mean? I, it doesn't feel like it's something that can actually hurt me, and yet I get that little, maybe that's my version of a roller coaster, right, mm -hmm. is, is reading. Well, it's the living King. vicariously, right? Yeah, but exactly. But you know it's not real. Yeah. And, like, what's so interesting is so, um, you know, when that movie came out, The Sixth Sense, um, M. Night Shyamalan, um, which is a wonderful movie, beautifully constructed, and just mm -hmm. the whole thing is just a 
tour de force as far as I'm concerned. But um, I didn't realize this about my husband, um, that he did not enjoy scary movies or TV. Um, but I was like, let's go to this movie. You know, we're sitting in the movie theater, and, and as the movie is playing and it's very creepy and scary, he keeps, you know, gently leaning over and, and patting my arm and saying, are you okay? <laughs> And I was like, yes, I'm okay. And a few minutes later, are you okay? Are you okay? Do you need to leave? And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. And, so, and the third time I was like, buddy, you're not okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're the one that wants to leave. <laughs> and, um, but now we've been married so long now. He's just like, nope, you're on your own. Yeah, I go to all the scary yeah. movies by myself or now with my sons that are old. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where it came from, but um, I just, I don't know. It's crazy. So yes, one of my books um, is about um, a young woman who is the daughter of a uh, uh, international best-selling, very famous kind of iconic horror yeah, writer. Yeah. And she's a woman, she's kind of like the woman version of Stephen King, right? And um, she has this one book that she's very famous for called Kitten. Kitten is a very bad little girl <laughs> <laughs> who does bad things. Um, anyway, so the story is the daughter um, has been approached to write a sort of tell-all mommy dearest uh, version about her mother because her mother was not a great parent. So she's taken on this um, job and she is going to investigate the real life murder that inspired the book Kitten and find out if her mother possibly stole yeah. Some stories. I love the book within a book concept too. I think yes, that's really fun. Yes, that was fun. really fun to yeah. write. Yeah. And um, so what I did in research for this was in um, the space of a couple of weeks. I, I, so I needed Kitten to be like this 1970s horror novel. So for research, I read, reread Carrie, Rosemary's Baby, <laughs> The Exorcist. <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you didn't have nightmares? Not at all. Oh, my God. And my husband was like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I this is was. wrong. Was he sleeping and with one eye open? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. So, anyway, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I just, I like it. There are things that scare me, but it's not that. <laughs> so... Um, well, you are braver than I. Okay, so but so back to this though. Like, why do I enjoy that kind of? I I love suspense thriller, but I also love horror. Like, why do we as people love these books? Do you think it's just that kind of vicarious, like s scare roller coaster sensation, or is it the figuring out the puzzle of the yeah. mystery? I think what? it's a little bit of both. I think that you know. Um, knowing that you're reading a fictional story and so everything plus in a book I mean I don't know if you guys do this some I know plenty of people who do they flip to the end just to make sure everything's going to be okay no right no so way. you can you can control the setting yeah. I think um, in that in that way so um, that's part of it but I also think you know Readers are um, really smart, and they um, love figuring out a puzzle mm -hmm. when you present them with a puzzle and trying to, you know, picking up on all the clues and um, trying to figure out what's going to happen, where the story is going, who's the bad guy, who's mm -hmm. going to come in and save, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's part of the fun as well. And which is, you know, it's great to do as a reader. It makes it really hard for us as authors yes. because... I mean, at one point, haven't all the stories been told and all the twists been done? And, you know, so you have to keep flipping the script and figuring out a new way to tell a story that's going to feel fresh and interesting and not predictable. Do you, super hard. Do you mind if a reader, does it bother you if a reader figures out the, um, the twist? I mean... It depends on what they figure out. I mean, because, you know, in a book, they, if they say, oh, I knew who the bad guy was, well, you know, there's, a, what, maybe five, six, seven choices. So, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. what are the statistics? I'm yeah. crappy at math, but somebody <laughs> could tell me what that yeah. would be, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it doesn't, 
I don't know. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. It, yeah, I love the, the best feeling is when they said, oh, my God, I did not see that coming yes. at all. Yes. Yeah. Don't you? Oh, I mean, yeah, you for sure. And another thing, too, that I thought that I didn't know um, would that I would enjoy when I first started writing these kind of um, page-turning suspense books, um, I remember a reader coming up to me and saying, oh, my gosh, I read it in three hours. Yeah. And I was like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> it took me three years it to write this. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized very quickly yeah, that that's that was a, that's a compliment. A good thing. Yes. yes, that's what you want. Like read it is, in one gulp. That's perfect. It yes. would be a lot worse yeah. if they say it took me three years to write. Right. <laughs> that's yes. exactly right. Yes. This is so true. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I love most about your books is um, that they all have this... Um, dark and creepy and angsty sense of place, so the setting. Mm -hmm. um, and that the setting is so important to your story that it's almost like this, this separate character, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this looming sense of something really bad is going to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> and you've said, you know, I mean, m your books have all been in the South, right? Like right. Alabama, uh, Georgia, um, Appalachians. Well, one, one hot and sticky island in the Caribbean. Right, right, But right. so... Um, that all makes me kind of like wonder um, where you're from. Well, you said you're from here, right? But like, yeah. was your childhood okay? <laughs> <laughs> Are you all right? Should I be worried? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> no, I just think it it definitely goes back to that. The, the one thing that I always love about Gothic novels and Southern Gothic novels is, man, when you are reading... Carson McCullers or Flannery O'Connor, I mean, you know exactly where you are. When they're talking about the heat, you yeah. know, of a Georgia summer, um, you feel it, mm -hmm. you, you taste it, you smell it, you, you're there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just like, that's part of writing that I really love to create that scene and to ma make the person feel like mm -hmm. they're there. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like a lot, you're right, a lot of the dread, that sort of low level dread of, oh, something's going to happen, you can really use yeah. setting yeah. Um, to do that. And I think, you know, there's a lot of... Um, romanticization, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Of the South, you know, yeah. and, and some of it is, is maybe a little over the top and, and not quite accurate, but some of it's really true. And, and when you live here, you don't realize um, some of the delightful particulars mm -hmm. about living here. And that's why I, one of the reasons I love coming back to Birmingham, because I left when I was 17, went to Auburn, and um, got married really young, and then I was in Georgia and New York. And but when I come back to Birmingham, it's changed so much since the mid '80s, and um, I, it's just ever. I just love it here because I just I'm like so interested in the, the the areas of town that have changed and that haven't changed and that the way the old buildings are still incorporated mm -hmm. into the new. I'm just, I could go on forever about it. But anyway, y'all love your city. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and my childhood was the <laughs> <laughs> um, So speaking of settings, so uh, Kimberly's next book coming out um, this summer, correct? Yes, yeah. in June. In June. Yes. Um, Stranger in the Lake. In the Lake. Not around the lake <laughs> or on, on the, the lake. lake. In the lake. In the lake. <laughs> um, so I was, the minute she, you told me about this book, I was obsessed because I love lake books, books about yeah. lakes. Yeah. So yeah. um, do you want to tell us sure. a little bit? Give us a little taste. Yeah. So it's about a stranger in, in a lake. lake. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so it's set in a fictional lake town, um, and it's in North Carolina, kind of up 
in the area of Cashers and Highlands, which if you guys know anything about that area, it's a very um, big divide between rich and poor, right? You have these people have moved in and they've built these multi-million dollar homes on the edge of the lake and they um, have created like this, this vibrant place where there's restaurants and boutiques and all this really lovely stuff. And then you have the people who have lived there for generations who, you know, are flipping the burgers and scrubbing the toilets when they can find a job. So there's this really big, you know, rich, poor dynamics, which yeah. automatically I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, my main character named Charlotte, she is from what I call the muddy side of the mountain. So the, the you know, poor side, she's had a really hard life, um, neglectful mother, a father who's, you know, disappeared on them, gone to jail. Um, and um, she marries up and she falls in love with this man, Paul, who is 11 years older than her. And um, she, you know, moves into his house and um, takes on his life and, and leaves that, you know, that tough life that she had behind. And um, one day, until one day, she discovers a stranger in the lake. And um, she calls the police, and the, the police come, and she overhears her husband say that he didn't know this woman. While when they flipped her over, she recognized her because she had seen her husband talking to her the <gasps> day prior in town. Ooh. So in the heat and the passion and the, and the stress of the moment, she backs him up on the lie, and the story kind of unravels from there. I cannot wait. <laughs> and it's all on a lake. I know, a I know. Misty. That was actually fun. And you know, oh, I yeah. grew up in that area, kind of, sort of. <clears throat> I mean, a little further up in Tennessee. So it felt a lot for me, you know, like rediscovering my roots. And yeah. it was fun to write. It was fun to write. That's a little Southern Gothic right yeah. there. Yeah, there you go. That See? <laughs> Um, so let's talk about plot twists. We kind of touched on them before, but we've talked a lot. And when I say a lot, do you want to see our text string a lot about <laughs> how the market almost demands crazier and crazier yeah. twists, right? And, and, and how we as authors, I mean, do we, do we go with that? Do we, you know, try to find a way around that? Like, how, how much pressure do you feel to come up with that jaw-dropping twist? And do you know when you start a book how it's going to end, how you're going to get there? Yeah. Well, I just got to say, I think you actually, I think, honestly, there's more pressure on you mm -hmm. um, as a writer. Um, for suspense. For, for, for the, that, like, yeah. Last chapter, to, yeah. okay, she has a book, you guys. I that, did it to myself, though, Yes, didn't you I? did. <laughs> you did it to yourself. So in the last, I mean, literally not even mm. the last chapter, the last sentence um, yeah. is a twist. And it is brilliant. It's brilliant. But you did it to yourself, yeah. right? So I now dug you that have hole to, <laughs> for myself. Yeah. So now you have to top yourself. Mm -hmm. I haven't... Um, I haven't felt that as much. Mm. Um, and I will say kind of the differences in my books, I feel like, yes, I want to do a really good twist, but I do feel like they allow for a little more room for it not to have to be the most earth shattering. Like you said, there's always like, in my books, there's who do you trust, who do you not trust, who's the villain, who isn't the villain. And right. there's a choice of, like, anywhere from three to five people. And I figure, you know, at some point, somebody's going to figure it out. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. What I hope for is that they continue to enjoy the psychological a psychological journey of the main character right, along the way right. and the ramifications right. and like now how is my character going to get out of this situation right. yeah yeah so but yeah there's tons of pressure and yeah. it's um and we talk about this too is that I think in response to that we've seen a lot of suspense books where the twist is just kind of tacked on at the end, and it feels a little unearned. Right, and it's readers, at least I as a reader, I don't like to be tricked. I want, I want right. it to feel like, you know, it, all the clues were there, I just missed them for right. some reason. Either right. because I was distracted with another character or whatever the reason, right. you know? It, it needs to feel 
true to the story. Right. And, and I think, I mean, I personally think it's only fair to give a setup, um, maybe subtly, but to give clues to the actual right, right. answer yeah. of, like, who's right. the villain and why they did it. Right. Um, instead of just, like, out of the blue. Yeah. Uncle Harry showed up. He did it, you yeah. know? And I can't remember where I read it. Some other author had talked about, like, writing a suspense novel as a strategic reveal of information. Yes. Like, you're dropping these clues along the yes. way. And, of course, some people are going to be really smart and pick up on all of them. Right. But it, the best, I think probably the best um, review I can get or, a, you know, somebody, a reader who says to me, I loved it so much that when I finished, I went back and read it again to see what I missed. I was yes. like, that's wow. what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. That is a compliment. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so along these lines, um, this is just my, every time I read one of your novels, I am just like completely envious and just in awe. Um, your novels are very tightly constructed. Um, there's just not a lot of extra fat on them. They, uh, they just move and every sentence, there's a purpose for every sentence. And I just, I just, I love yeah. them. <laughs> That's why we're friends fan. right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, so and you do, you know, and I'll text you. I'll, like, live text her as I'm reading her book going, this is so good. How did you do that? And, the, you know, I've done that with me. you, too. I've done that with you, too. Show I was me. like, damn it, you're going to kill him off, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I love this character. You're going to um, kill him. And you've kind of answered this already. But so for the book that doesn't come magically to you in the middle of the night um, mm -hmm. in, in fully formed. Right. How do you figure out that really intricate um, construction? Do you have to take long walks, mm -hmm. showers? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time plotting out a story before I write the first word. And um, I start out with like the big post-it, you know, things that you stick on your wall. And I have four of them typically, and maybe one extra for some notes and, you know, it's First quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter of the book. And I just start throwing stuff up there and filling it in. And then um, once that's kind of filled in and I know what my story is, I take it to the computer and then I do it in a spreadsheet. And I'm sounding really anal right now, aren't I? I know. But that's... I could never do that. I, that's the only way... My stories have a lot of moving parts. And yeah. that's the only way that I can keep... Um, like I have, you know, a column for the scenes and the chapters, and then I have a column for here's where my red herring, these are the clues, and then kind of another column where it, you know, fills in, mm -hmm. you know, is followed up in chapter 20 or whatever it is. <sighs> That's amazing. And I don't always stick to it 100%, but it gives me, it helps, it, it helps me fill in the parts of the story so that when I sit down to write, I'm not like, gosh, what happens next, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's part of it. And I do take a lot of walks. I have a dog. I take some walks. I, my best ideas tend to come in the shower or in the gym or, you know, when you're when you let go, which is maybe why Dear Wife came to me the way it did, because I was asleep, and yep. it's your subconscious that's working, right? Yep. It's always thinking of these things, and it gives it to you when you're kind of... Yep in that place where you're not thinking about the story. Right, right. So. I, but God, my process is so much messier. It's just like, it's, it's a, it, you would die. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think funny, it would you stress know, you Yeah, out. I think every author, there's no right or wrong no, no. way of doing things. Everybody figures it out themselves. It took me a couple of books to get to a place where I thought, okay, this is yeah. how I want to approach <laughs> it. Um, I know a lot of authors and, and authors in our genre who like just sit down, they ha they're like, I don't know what's gonna happen. And they just start telling themselves the story and that's how they come up with the story. Yeah. Which I've tried that. I write myself into a lot of corners yeah. and cry a lot, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. So, um, and we kind of talked about this before, you kind of touched on it, but um, a lot of your books have this feminist Slant. And we've talked about how women are really dominating 
our genre yeah. right now. Um, women protagonists, um, women writing about women, right? And right. women who save themselves. And titles with girl in yeah. the title. Which I have women, one. Wife. So. I have yeah. a wife title, yeah. 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 So um, where does where does that come from? What what is that? Another another I'm not sure exactly where it comes from other than like I've never set out to um, <clears throat> write a feminist book or you know a book with feminist themes. Um, I just think it's as simple as being a woman and having been a girl. And I mean, yeah, I think as growing up um, in the '80s, a lot of uh, you know the books that I had to read for school. Didn't have a lot of women in them. Yeah, that's and true. I remember being so angry, like getting my school books. I'm like, none of these are for girls. Come on. <laughs> yeah, and I and it when it happens once, that's okay. But yeah. when it happens over and over again, you really start. I mean, you're in danger of losing the kids' yeah, interest. That's true. I'll never forget, like um, in school. My, uh, so this kid who was like, he was like the, the voracious reader who was reading all the cool books. And I felt competitive with mm -hmm. him because I needed to read more books than he did. <clears throat> so um, he was reading The Hobbit. And I think this was fourth grade. So I was like, well, I'm, I've got to read The Hobbit too and show him. And I picked up The Hobbit and I was like, it is there are no girls in this. <laughs> there is just a lot of boy hobbits and <laughs> and, and but and no offense, Tolkien, we love you, but yeah. no. And there was like boy dwarfs singing boy songs, yeah. boy elves. It's true, yeah. And it's funny, like the things that we gravitate to that maybe. Like I, I said before, I gravitate towards marriage stories, whereas I've been married for 25 years plus. I mean, uh, let's not do the math, but um, yeah, and happily so. Yeah. And then I write about these marriages in crisis and these, you know, husbands that are keeping these horrible, yeah. awful secrets. And I don't know where that comes from. It's, it's. I don't know. I don't know either. It's, it's just, strange. You just write out of some kind of... Um, but I have heard that, that a lot of writers are writing to, to answer questions for themselves, to work out stuff in their own life. And I, I do think with sort of the feminist angle is, is that um, it is like as I've gotten older, you know, moving through the world as a woman is a different mm -hmm. story yeah. sometimes than moving through the world as a man. Right. And for I think sure. it's um, to kind of show that um, show how we as women move through the world differently, um, more cautiously. We have to, you know, make plans. And I mean, there's a million, yeah. uh, there's a million yeah. different aspects to it, but I find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, th the dangers we are open to right. are different. Just by being female. Vulnerable to right. just, yeah. yeah. So, um, I just think that's interesting yeah. to me as a woman. I yeah. hope it's interesting not only to other women, but men. I love it when I have um, uh, male readers, yeah, too, same. say that they really enjoyed it. Same. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, when we talk about planning our, our books, but really ideas are something that's always coming to us, especially if, you know, you and I are on this schedule, basically a book a year mm -hmm. is how it's been for mm -hmm. you and for me as well. So are you a person with like dozens of bubbling pots of ideas on your stove, on your 12 burner range? Or no, you, <laughs> I wish, right? <laughs> or are you, you work on one thing like in a linear fashion? So I, um, I have a file on my computer, I'll send, if I run into a news article or something, you know, read something somewhere, I'll send it to myself and I file it and it's literally a folder on my computer that's called crazy shit. <laughs> 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 so when it's time for me to come up with a story idea, I'll go there and I'll read through this stuff and you know, sometimes... Mine's just called ideas. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I also have a file of, um, this is kind of an aside, and it's called I Don't Suck, and it's for when people write me to tell yes. me this. <laughs> I don't suck. I don't suck. That's where I put my fan mail. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, but, you know, I think the ideas that, that um, really stick with me and that really grow into, like, what we were talking about before, that lift of, like, th I have a book now, those are the ones I don't really even need to write down yeah. because I'll yeah. think of them and I'll, they'll just, like, keep bubbling um, and um, I'll keep adding on and, oh, well, what if this happened? And then you think of characters, who could you put in that situation? So I think those are the stories that, um, that really stick with you, whether you put it in your folder on your computer or not. Yeah. Um, but I am a one idea at a time kind of person. It's hard for me to um, be busy with one book as you guys heard before, I'm a little obsessed with my stories and how to, you know, plan mm -hmm. it out and write it out. And I'm also on deadline. Yeah. So I don't have time to just sit and dream up all these different ideas. I right. need to like, here's my idea. Do you like it? Okay. Then I'm going to go make my, you know, uh, outline. Then I'm going to write this thing. And then I have to turn it in mm -hmm. September 1st. Yes. <laughs> so, so you are monogamous. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah. you have a lot of ideas. I do. You always have lots I do, and it, it feels like a curse sometimes. My um, husband calls it, there's some kind of personality test that calls it idea phoria. Mm. And, and it's literally like that kind of euphoria where a lot of ideas will mm. come to me. And a lot of them I, I feel like are good. Mm -hmm. You know, they have that kind of, ooh, beginning, middle, end thing. And I just, ha I mean, it is, I have to, you know, jot it down just to kind of purge it. Get it, it. out of your yeah. head. Yeah, but yeah. I, I can't work on them all. Yeah. Um, that's tough for me. Yeah. I'm still pretty, like, single-minded. Yeah. But I do get a lot mm -hmm. of ideas, and I wish... And good I just... ones. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of ideas, um, for readers who fell in love with you out of the gate with Bearing the Honeysuckle Girls, you have some good news. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Burying the Honeysuckle Girls um, was my first novel, and I'm um, set here in Alabama. It basically um, is that dual timeline um, that I told you about, and um, in the present day story, the main character, Althea, basically travels the entire state of Georgia. She goes, she starts in Mobile and heads up um, to Birmingham and over to Tuscaloosa. And then she goes up to Northeast Alabama where I made up a, a small town in the mountains up there um, because some bad things happened up there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't wanna like call out any of the nice towns out right. there. but. Um, yeah, so I have written the sequel to that book. It's coming out in October. It's called Reviving the Hawthorne Sisters. And um, it's actually kind of a prequel sequel. So the present day story is a sequel, What Happens After Honeysuckle Girls. And the uh, story in 1934 is the story of Dove, um, who is a young runaway from Pritchard Hospital, i.e. Bryce Hospital. Um, she runs away when she's um, 13. Um, she was born there and um, has to make her way in the world during the Depression and um, winds up hooking up with another uh, young girl and they form a duo called the Hawthorne Sisters who are um, tent evangelists, faith healers, ministers, and possible con artists. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We're not sure. So, um, so yeah, it's Dove from Honeysuckle Girls. It's her story, and I just love her to pieces because yeah. she is a little scrappy go-getter, oh, and yeah. and she's not averse to telling a few I lies. And, and I've seen some, the cover, y'all. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So speaking of that, and this is for me a, a very much a return to that kind of historical present day Southern Gothic thing. So do you ever dream of just writing something totally out of your genre? Like a romance? Yeah. Or anything. 
No. Horror novel. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, you know, well, you're I, the queen of domestic suspense. You should I have to give up my tear. No, I, know. Um, I, I um, you know, I try to do something different with every book that keeps me a little challenged and takes takes it my skills or my my storytelling in a little bit of a different direction. So, as long as I'm still feeling challenged and happy about that, yeah. I don't see myself going. You know, never say never. Sure. I did just um, try to propose a story that's set in Amsterdam. I, um, my husband's Dutch. We lived there for many years. I have one of my kids lives there now. And so um, I would really, and I've been saying it since I first started writing, I would love to write a story and set it in Amsterdam. And they shot me down. They were like, no, we really want to. <laughs> I don't know. They wanted to keep me stateside. And I get it. It is very different. And it's hard to... Although my story wasn't like that at all, what I proposed, but um, you know, it's hard to take a story international and not have it turn into like this spy kind yeah, of, yeah. you know. And I don't want that, but um, I would love to be able to set a story there. We'll see. Um, and so atmospheric as well. I know, right? But you know, um, I have a friend, Karma Brown. She's an author, and um, she just came out with a book. Uh, a recipe for a Perfect Wife. Mm -hmm. And that was a book that she, she calls it her secret book. And um, she had proposed it, got shot down, but she was under contract for, I don't know, two or three more books. Mm -hmm. And so it took her five years to write. She did it in between all of her contracted projects. Yeah. Um, and now it's out and it's doing great. So maybe the Amsterdam book will be my secret book. I don't know. Not so secret now. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me in five years, we'll see. Yeah. 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 So I once got asked this question, um, and now I ask it of everybody I talk to and in interview. When you decided to become an author, and specifically in the kind of stuff that we write, mm -hmm. did you have to have like a, a coming out moment with your friends and family and be like, hey, I write books about murder and <laughs> death and destruction, and um, will you still be my friend? <laughs> Will you not think poorly of me? <laughs> yeah, I had, um, yes, there was kind of that moment. Although my husband had a good idea, you know, from the horror movie thing. And because I always make him, uh, from the time we were married, I was like, Friday night, it's time for Dateline. Let's watch, you know, somebody get murdered. Oh and <laughs> He's like, and then, you know, one Christmas, my whole Christmas list was like um, every Anne Rule cr a true crime novel. He was like, you are just, this is not in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> but so he had a good idea of what was coming. But um, so my, my family of origin here in Birmingham, the first time I, I kind of realized that they knew what I was doing. I had um, come home for <clears throat> Easter and we were sitting down to dinner, um, Easter dinner at my brother and sister-in-law's house. And we're sitting down and we have the prayer and everything is very, you know, reverent and nice and beautiful china and crystal out. And my brother <laughs> says, all right, everybody, be careful what you say because Emily will put you in her book. <laughs> I mean, and that really was a moment for me where I was like, oh, oh, mm -hmm. they really might be afraid I'm doing that, A, yeah. you know, and, and B, the kind of books I write. Or, right. You know. um, because I will say, like, you know, I, I told you I grew up here. I went to Briarwood Christian High School. So some of the things I write are not... They're they, not, they're not, you're not in their library. They, they are, they are, they break the Ten Commandments. I mean, my characters do. I don't, of course. But, um, so yeah, there was that moment where I had to really honestly say, no, I, this is, you know, what, what stays at Easter, you know, what happens at Easter stays, stays at, at Easter. Easter, but I'm not going to do that. But then, um. There was another um, incident that I found actually really touching. Um, so my middle son 
was in high school at the time, and, and right before I had published my first book, I was kind of nervously waiting word from the publisher was, you know, were they going to buy the book or not? And so to kind of um, uh, occupy my mind elsewhere, I was working on short stories, mostly flash fiction, you know, under a thousand words. Which is so hard to write, by the way. It's fun, though. It's just... You know, it, anyway, it's it's a different kind of part of your yeah. brain. But um, so I had written this like truly, it, it's a horror short story, um, and it was based on um, these this show I had seen about um, a documentary about these workers in a chicken processing plant um, out in Kansas, I think, and <clears throat> they were. Um, uh, uh, mentally disabled and being taken advantage of, and it was a very, very sad story. So in my story, one of the workers gets revenge, <laughs> and it was pretty gratifying to write. Because <laughs> I think in real life, these these poor guys like do, did not, you know, that yeah. it did not end well for them. So I wrote the story, and um, it was a little, it was it was a little violent, it was a little gory, and. Um, Anyway, it got published in this literary magazine. I was very excited and proud. And uh, I was telling my son and husband about it. My son said, oh, I want to read it. So I handed my computer over. And I'm looking at him, and he's like, oh, you know, reading. <laughs> and he finished it. And he said to me, you know, Mom, I don't want to read anything else you want. <laughs> and I... And at first I was like, oh, why not? He said, no, he, I mean, bless his heart. He's just a lovely, lovely, thoughtful kid. He said, this is beautifully written. I think it's fantastic. I'm so proud of you, but this is not my mother. Mm -hmm. Like he said, I want to look at you as like fuzzy mom who does the laundry and fixes dinner and loves me. I don't want to look at you as this yeah. person. Like yeah. I, it's just, he couldn't hold those things. Yeah. And so he has not read any of my books wow. and my youngest son, 16, no interest in reading my oldest mm -hmm. son, 23. Yeah. He reads them all. Yeah. How funny. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> That was my coming out moment. <laughs> they were like, proud of you, not going to read it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. What about you? Any questions do from we, audience? Do we yeah. want to do questions? or? Sure. Except I can't see, so. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Your husband's just a little bit afraid. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, he always, mine always makes that joke. Especially because, like I said, I write a lot about, you know, marriages gone wrong. And he's like, do we need to talk? Are we okay? <laughs> and one of my books is actually called The Marriage Lion. I've had, I've had readers say to me, I was reading this at home, and my husband comes in, and he's like... Do we need therapy? What's happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had the thing I told you where my husband and I, like, we're watching Datelines a lot. And, you know, it's always the spouse who's done it. Yeah, and, it's like, always the husband. Always, you know. And then, or the wife. And um, uh, so early on in our marriage, um, you know, we had an agreement. We made a pact that if, in fact, something went sideways in our marriage, that we would get a divorce rather than murder each other. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> And he, I mean, I will say he periodically is like, that's still on, You remember right? it? You remember? <laughs> Did he make you sign something? <laughs> no. I can't see. Anybody else? Yeah. First of all, I uh, read your book with your wife because of a book group, because it would not have been what I picked, but I love it. So oh, thank you. you. Book groups. But um, uh -huh. the um, other thing I want to say is the research, because I read at the end where you interviewed police stations, and, and I'm sure you're, for your novels too, mm -hmm. you must do research. Could you touch on that? I mean, do police people want to talk to you about these things? And how do you go about doing research on that? 
Did I say that? Did I? Oh, I don't remember writing that. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> did I do research? You know, did I do research? You know, yeah, the end of a novel and uh-huh. websites and all yeah. that fit into yeah. locations. And- well, yeah, I do, um, I do a lot of online um, research for pretty much all my books, and I do it a lot as I'm writing. I mean, I'll do, like, the bulk of the research beforehand when I'm doing my outlining and stuff. Um, but the, you nev- you don't know what you don't know. So once you actually get into the scene, there's always stuff you have to look up. Um, yeah, I do most of it online. I'm trying to remember back who else I I talked to for that particular book. Mm. <laughs> it's like, been a minute. Rem- <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's, there's research. In fact, the book I'm writing right now... Um, if I'll, I'll put out a call here, like I need to talk to a police officer on mm-hmm. the Birmingham Mounted Patrol. If anybody knows one, <laughs> on the Birmingham what? Mounted Patrol, like, like on the horses. Horse? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's always a bit of that, and um, I'm always nervous to call people and say I've I've interviewed. But mine is mostly medical. Mm-hmm. Like, I need to speak with a doctor about what really happens when, you know, there yeah. was, um, yeah. I had an issue of lead I've done poisoning. that with attorneys, too. And actually, yeah. I was doing... Oh, yeah, attorneys yeah. Are. I was, um, when I was writing The Marriage Lie, I lived across the street from a friend of ours, still a friend, but he's an attorney in Atlanta. And, and so I would, like, text him these really random, weird questions, like, does this work? Because I was, you know, it was mm-hmm. about the plane crash, and I was trying to figure out the legalities mm-hmm. of, like, the money and all that stuff that happened mm-hmm. after, and there might have been a little bit of crime involved. <laughs> um, yeah. And so he was giving me a lot of advice, and then I'm writing this scene, and this big guy walks into the scene, and he looks a lot like my name neighbor and he was an attorney and he was the kind of the vehicle to explain this whole thing um but he wasn't in my outline so like I said you know I do these outlines I don't always stick to them but sometimes it just kind of works their way into the book yeah but yeah so it just every story is different is there anyone else yes how did you get the names for your characters (laughs) I actually have a running list of names, and I'll I'll pull from them. But it really, for me, it has to feel right. And yes. if it doesn't, and I can't like get a grip on that character, and sometimes it's just a matter of changing the name, and then all of a sudden, yeah. it's exactly who I it's want it to be. A, it's an almost mystical yeah, process I agree. for me. Uh-huh. And I will say too, um, that's an element. But for me, also, I have three sons, so all the girl baby names I had picked out are now characters of mine. Stop. Really? (laughs) I'm like, I love you boys, but we have Meg and Eve and Daphne. I love it. Is there any? I can't see. It's so hard to see. I know with the light. Anybody else? Yell them yes. out. As an author, do you have a favorite of your books? Mm-hmm. Or are they all equal in your mind? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, it's always hard. It's um, it's kind of like asking me to choose between my kids. <laughs> I love them all equally but differently. <laughs> um <laughs> That there is are diplomatic s- answer. Yeah, but there are definitely some books that were easier to write than others, and so I tend to feel a little more tender towards those stories just because mm-hmm. the memories of the other ones were so, mm-hmm. you know, um, maybe Fraught. not so great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I don't know if I have one particular story I love the most. There are, there are elements of each yes, story, that's I what could I was say. say. I love the way that... Um, you know, dear, well, I can't say it without giving away the story, yeah, so I'm not going to say don't, it. No spoilers. Yeah. But, yeah, I have, like, a, a favorite main character. Yes. Or a favorite scene. Yep. Or a favorite element, like my that book within a book is mm-hmm. one of my favorite elements. Yeah. Um, Actually, my favorite characters from my stories are not the main, but the secondary characters. Oh, yeah. There are a couple of secondary characters that I just really love. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know what that is about. Yeah. I think because as a secondary character, they get to say things that... Yes. ...and do things that a main character can't. Yes. So. Over here. I was wondering, when you do your writing, are you on a schedule for each day, or how does that work best? So I like to get up and do writing in the morning. Um, I 
typically am behind my computer by 7.30 or 8. Um, I know there's this whole thing on Twitter called the 5 a.m. Writers Club. I'm like, no, ma'am, nope. <laughs> not happening. But I do kind of like to get to it first thing in the morning. And then um, I write, I typically lose steam early afternoon. And then I go to like emails and social media and all that stuff. But yeah, with like, I use a writing software. Do you write in Scrivener? Mm -mm. Uh, I use this writing software, but you can put in your deadline and but if you write, you know, Monday through Friday or seven days a week or six days, whatever, and it calculates how many words you have to write a day in order to hit that deadline. So I typically stick to that. Mm -hmm. That's and, my um, goal. Yeah, when I'm writing a first draft, for me, um, momentum is very important. Just on that first, you know, getting it out on um, the page. And so I have a word count goal every day. I have to write at least 2,000 words a day. That's a lot. It, it is. And, it's, and I don't always reach it, but mostly that's the goal of, of what I try to do. But then after that, I'm a little looser with, you know, I'll take some days off and editing can be, you know, I'm not that. That's really the only time that I'm kind of structured mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Oh my gosh, no, but I have a friend who does that. I, I'm i not good telling a story verbally. Mm -mm. I really am yeah. not. I think it's a different part of your brain. It is. I don't know if that's true or not, but it feels like it. I think like it is. It. Science. <laughs> 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 We're like, that was not my thing in school, but I'm pretty sure that's science, and you're right. But it's... Yeah. Um, I do have a friend that loves it. Yeah, I do too. And um, she has like some mobility issues with her hands. She has arthritis and she has taught herself to just like do it in the, and she, there's a website. She sends the, the, um, the tape or whatever it is, the file to oh, them. And they transcribe They not only transcribe it, but they put in the punctuation, like everything. Oh, wonderful. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think it's a great um, I wish service. I could do it. Yes. But we're not like I see one up there. Anybody, are we? Yeah. Crazy question, but are the two of you, your husbands, other coffees? Are, are they, they what? what? Oh. oh. <laughs> well, I better be. <laughs> Should we call him and ask? No, my husband, my husband loves C.S. Lewis and Robert Jordan because my son reads fantasy, and so they have read all of Robert Jordan's books together. Um, but I will say, so other than that, he doesn't read a lot of fiction, but he, y'all, it's so sweet. He, like, reads my books, like, multiple times. Aww. And, like, he, so he's an outdoorsman. Um, he likes to hunt and fish and just be in the outdoors. So he's very attuned to nature. And I, as I told you earlier, am scared of nature. <laughs> so there are snakes and crocodiles. <laughs> right. I know. So, but he's the guy that reads my book and is like, I would like you to know that you cannot hear the doves cooing after nightfall, Emily. <laughs> Helpful. Thank you. It is helpful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's like, this does not bloom in that season. I mean, he's very, he's like, he's my nature <laughs> editor. It. So, but yeah. Anyone Anybody else? else? I can't see. Oh. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Um, what do you enjoy reading? And I think you mentioned that you like to read what you write, and, mm -hmm. but is that confusing when you're in the middle of the book? Yeah, that's a good question. Better? Sometimes, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty good at, you know, putting it in its place. Um, I do tend to um, choose stories that are very different than what I'm writing at the time, mm -hmm. so I don't get them confused. Like sometimes if the voice is too close or whatever, then I will, might put it down. But um, I, I actually find that I'm, as I'm reading, my subconscious is working on my own story, and sometimes I'll get some really great ideas as I'm... You said the same thing yeah. earlier to me. Yeah. That, like, sometimes you'll be reading... I always am texting myself or emailing for my crazy shit file, you know, <laughs> um, ideas to myself as I'm yeah. reading. So... Yeah. I tend to get distracted a little bit when I'm... If, if I'm... If my brain is full of my own story... 
and I'm reading a book. It's not that the book I'm reading is not good, but I, I just, this you can't story on is it. speaking to me yeah. in my head, and I'll have to put it aside. Also, I, lately, it's hard for me to read in my own genre, only because I, I feel somehow distanced from it. Like, I don't get swept away because mm-hmm. I'm thinking, oh, here's how she did this or here's how he, you know, yeah. arra- structured this and it s- lessens the enjoyment yeah. some. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's that? true. Although occasionally I'll pick up a book too that I'm like, I get so swept away oh, by the story. That's beautiful. So I was just telling Emily before um, J.T. Ellison, a friend of ours who has been to this um, Yeah. Last year, maybe? So yeah. Pretty recently. But her latest, Good Girls Lie, I read that because um, so she good. came through Atlanta and we did an in conversation with her. And um, it was so good that it was one of those books that I finished. And then I went back and I, like, chapter by chapter wrote down, like, how she structured the story, mm-hmm. how she, you know, like, worked in the past, present kind of Mm -hmm. thing. It was just, she she did a great job. So like, you know, you do, you do learn a lot from reading. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Anybody? Anybody? I can't see. see. (laughs) Awesome. Y'all, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much.